Okay. So I think today, based on our Twitter poll, our Twitter poll currently has Claymores at 30% and Sword. So I guess we'll look at Claymores first. I only have three Claymore users right now. I have a typo in my Twitch username in my latest tweet. <gasps> I make this uh, mistake all the time. Thank you for telling me. I'm hoping that posted, right? Okay. Omukase. So out of all of them, actually, I own every single Catalyst user. Claymore users only have three out of five or six, I think. Um, but that should be enough, right? A bow users have actually f four, I think, four or five. But I think for now we'll look at we'll look at um, the Claymore users because. I'm Beidou. Wait, do I only have two? No, Noel. You can see Noel is only level one. Hello. I'll probably also try to record sections of these so that we can frame through it later. Just because I don't, there is no slowdown option in Genshin yet. Not that there should be. But in terms of just like observing, observing stuff, it becomes a little bit harder. So, one of the biggest cool things about the weapons in this game, right, are basically when they're running around doing stuff, they don't have any weapons, so you can't tell. But then when they start attacking, their weapons just appear. League of Legends does this thing where we have sub meshes, and basically sub meshes are textures and materials that are applied to a certain geo that can be turned on and off through the game engine. So obviously, right now. There are some animations, for example, that don't require the sword to exist, and then there are some animations that do. This mechanic is actually very similar to what people recognize it from, from Nier Automata. Holy crap, why are there so many people watching? Welcome to the stream. But this mechanic of having the weapon on the back, just floating, and then just disappearing through a VFX, like, one, a texture fade, and then a VFX effect scrolling over it. I think it became popularized with Nier Automata. I'm not 100% sure if other games utilize uh, this mechanic, but there's a reason why this is smart, which is because for every single character, animation is obviously very expensive. And you can imagine if every single character, thanks for the follow, Raphalt. It's either Raphalt or Raphalt. Beto draws a lot of attack animations from Nier Automata, if I recall. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things for like, if you, you know, you take any kind of character that has like a weapon. Thank you for the follow. I am Thomas. M. Thomas. You can probably put some care, some animation side by side. They'd be pretty similar. But if you think about it, it's like you take a sword. There are only so many variations of which you can swipe a sword. For example, this first auto, this first attack, if you're going to do an upward slice like this, there are only so many variations that you can do for this, right? Because um, if you're going to swipe forward, a lot of times your weight has to go forward, then back, and your sword, motion-wise, really only goes from top down, down top, left, right, right, left, and then maybe some variation in angle. Oh, my point on the back backside when it's like when you're running around and it's floating behind you is mainly because for animation, there is a big element of weight right so whether you're holding a big sword a short sword a bow a catalyst or something those all affect how you walk and run right and if you're holding onto something like that and you're running the problem is if you have sword shield or any of that kind of stuff it changes how you run i'm actually let's see i don't know does breath of the wild change how you run depending on what sword you have I think it might change the upper body position, but I don't know if it changes the gait. It might change the gait. The point here being, I think, is like the more animations that you have a character interacting with an object, to make it more believable, you have to have a completely different animation set. So not only is this, is this kind of thing where, where it's riding on the back, kind of like one, visually appealing, and also like a fantasy kind of mechanic, but it also makes it so that when you're running, you do not have to author a specific animation for every single character anytime you change. And also just remember, like, depending on how tall your character is in this situation, we have different heights. That could also change the animation, and then someone would have to do another version, a second version or something just to fit that. There probably are some games that go above and beyond and, like, do all those animation changes, right? But the question really ends up being, is it cost effective for the value you're getting? Do you, does the game become that much better by having every character move exactly differently. And we can already tell sort of, right? Like we have these three characters. Um, obviously the runs are all very similar between the females, I think. Even though Noel and um, Beto are different.
different in height. Their runs are actually all very similar, um, except for the secondary motion and stuff. I have no idea what a gate is. A uh, gate, I believe the spelling for gate is G-A-I-T. Uh, and what I'm talking about for this is basically is a person's manner of walking. Um, I think normally a lot of times this is probably used to describe sort of like an animal and how they run, how fast they run. Because humans generally all walk at the same speed, give or take. Not 100%. But let us do this quickly. One. We're gonna record this one. Thank you for the follow. I am Evandal. Alright. Transition. There's one thing that people who work in games obviously are familiar with, I think, which is like blend tables, right? And if you work in the game engine, this is something that's very, very common, which is basically any animation you have is called by the engine and it plays. And then when you call a second animation, there's this thing called a blend, which basically means from whatever point you're changing in the animation to the other, the game will interpolate, right? So basically what this means is like anytime a character has an action where you command it to do something, so in Beidou's case, an attack, uh, it basically triggers a new animation call and for example if Fado is facing right and then my animation is Fado is supposed to face left it'll basically I'll, for the duration of the blend it will try to interpolate every single bone to the correct location in terms of translation rotation and scale for the upcoming animation and as a game animator I think one of the biggest things you have to we have to like sort of remember is how that interpolation behaves as well as, are we okay with just blending from A to B, right? So for example, one example is, you can see here is, she's still walking, because I'm obviously moving back left and right here. And then here you can see that she does a transition straight into this attack. So one of the first frames for the, her first attack, probably like for key pose, something like down here, something like around here. But you can see right here from this, this pose to this pose, there's a couple frames where it's just transitioning. Now, I feel like this one frame is not a key pose pose in in the original animation file. It's probably like starting around here or here. And this is one of those things where, for example, if you're tracking the feet, the feet will slide a little bit here, right? So front foot is moving forward, back foot is moving back, sliding on the floor. Obviously, if you're framing through, it's very easy to see. But in actuality, when you're playing the game, almost none of that matters. All you see here is the biggest change happening where her gra center of gravity is going from top to down into her antic pose, right? And this is a situation, for example, over one frame or maybe one or two. Actually, I think this is interesting here. Let's see. So you can see here that the sword phases in over like two frames. But also you can see that the sword is already on her back. I don't know if... So what I'm seeing here, right? We turn on annotation tools. Her sword looks like it's like this. Also, sorry, I do not have a pen on my setup right now, so I'm using my mouse to draw, and it may look really, really bad. But right here on this frame, it looks like almost as if the sword is right there. You can see this blurred out portion, and that's because like there is some sort of effect or texture that has been called to sort of blend in the sword. So I feel like there's like a disconnect between the frame that's calling the sword merge, the sword appearance, because it feels like it goes from here to here, to this. You know, but obviously not a big deal. In In motion, you don't see any of that. But I think if we're slowing it down just to look at it, to understand sort of what they're doing here, I think it's interesting to see, right? Like, playing in full motion, you don't see that at all, right? All right, so anyway, um, this is actually a very interesting concept in terms of blends, because for example, um, I showed off on my Twitter, Ganyu, doing her auto attacks for her bow. 
And obviously, you can obviously in most cases we are chaining all of our attacks as quickly as possible. But at the same time, animators have obviously authored animations that exist for the entire entirety of the weapon or the, the motion, right? For Beido, when she attacks, she has this where she settles, she holds it, and then returns to idle. And in this situation, there's an animation authored specifically for her weapon being on her left side, going to her right side, into this sort of ready idle stance in a way. It's not really a ready idle stance, but it's like the I have my weapon out idle if not doing anything because I just attacked, right? And a lot of times you don't see this specifically, um, mainly because when you're fighting, you're just doing this thing, right? And then you run away, and then it goes on her back, and then eventually this will disappear, right, by itself. Because I don't think they have not authored a like unsheathing sort of like floating mechanic, so they just they just live with a fade the weapon away. So in this situation, you'll see that she does she does her full thing, and then if we trigger next animation, the pose starts here, and she does a spin, right? Now, what's interesting that we can think about is you can see here that her legs are swapping spaces like this. So there's a little bit of me that's sort of like thinking, I wonder if they authored this pose specifically and then tracked these things. Because there's two ways of going about it, right? You could either animate specifically the spin or you can try to start on this pose roughly and then get the engine to spin across like 0.2 seconds, right? That's an option. Um, in my opinion, I think normally what ha people happens is you author like one frame here just to make sure that the computer knows you're starting at this orientation and then you do a couple frame throughs to get this to work. Um, but what's interesting about most game animations I think is that the transition into the next pose, a lot of times as long as you have secondary animation, the, th the other stuff that happens really doesn't matter. Like if you look at your feet, if you look at your root and your head, in practice, it doesn't matter. As long as people can say, okay, she's not wiggling out completely like a rag doll, that's fine. Because what communicates a lot of this spin, I feel like, is if you track these three things, it communicates sort of your character did this motion by spinning this way. Right? Um, and in this situation, whether it's simmed in game or simmed in the animation and then plastered here, I think for auto attacks it's probably simmed in animation and then just baked out. Because in this situation, you have no need for these to interact in the game. I think the only time that actually happens is probably like... I don't wanna... I actually haven't done any research in terms of like the people who worked on the animation, so I'm, I'm speaking out of my butt right now, so I, I can't confirm, but... I can say for League, at least, um, the way we animate is we do have a tool that helps us sort of do over overlap. Um, it's pretty unreliable a lot of times, so we have to finesse it a lot. But once you bake it out and then export it to game, most of those animations are 100% always going to look like that, right? They're not going to interact with anything else in the game. The only thing that does interact like that in the game is this thing called we, this thing that we use called Dragon Tech, and that's basically putting points on the rig that the game engine will track based on where you're moving and then we'll add a sort of delay on, on, on that. And so far that's been the most useful for things where characters are turning left and right. And that's basically it. So anything like cloth and stuff in the actual animation, we do have to sort of track ourselves in Maya and then we author it out into the game. But that's one thing to remember. So for example, the question is like, if let's say you do a three combo attack, if you are animating, in Maya and just doing it within Maya and not putting it to engine, then you basically just author all the all the frames. If you were authoring three separate exports into an engine, you do have to think about, okay, am I connecting A to B and B to C? So if my first attack is from right to left, then your next attack should theoretically start on the left side and then whatever comes following, right? I think what's also very interesting about animation games and VFX is the animator a lot of times animates the motion and the VFX artist puts in like this cool like blade swipe but you can see how like the blade swipe kind of just operates on its own right like 
for example, one thought would be, why not just have the effect start here? And then like also here and then here. And I think, I feel like the biggest thing is just like in motion, these things don't have to line up because as we know, motion is the feeling of, oh my God, stop. We don't need everyone to raid this stream, guys. Holy crap. Yeah. Well, welcome. Thank you, Love Strut, for uh, raiding. Welcome to the stream. We're just talking about Genshin Impact, looking at some animations. First, Claymore users. I'm not. I'm actually not talking about anything specific about Claymores right now. It's really just um, some thoughts and reflections on animation. But I appreciate the drop in, everyone. Um, so yeah, the first thing we were, we were sort of talking about was like animation and VFX don't have to match one one, one to one, right? So. There's a, there's a saying, I think, which was like, basically, as long as the eye has something to track, then everything else can work in service to it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, for example, I mean, you, you ask a lot of VFX artists, VFX artists probably would say like the VFX and Genshin are really clean, really nice. Um, and then animations, I think, as an animator, I would love to see more characters with more unique stuff. But as an animator, I also understand you know it takes a lot of time to author all that stuff but for these characters they get a lot of mileage on their special sets and things so i think it's enough maybe in the future maybe maybe miHoYo will eventually give animation set packs or something who knows okay so we see one swipe here but it's interesting right because we were talking about how basically the edge the leading edge of this weapon doesn't line up with the actual leading edge of this swipe and i mean there's a couple of reasons for that one is like okay for Gameplay, exactly what is the hitbox. And animation sometimes cannot 100% always show what the hitbox is. Um, but at the same time, if VFX is its own thing, VFX has to sort of prioritize their shapes and their motions. And I think maybe if you really want to polish, maybe you could change this animation pose to have the weapon here and then here possibly. But again, these are all really like small things that don't really matter. Maybe in like film, this is something that you would have to keep track of. But when you're doing this attack, you're not tracking this weapon, right? You're tracking this big arc. I guess that'd be more important in PvP too, right? Um, in PvP, gameplay is really, really important. So maybe everything has to line up much more. But in something like this, which is PV, just you're just rampaging, hitting stuff. The priority here really is coolness factor, right? So we don't have to go too crazy, um, is how I feel. But yeah, when it's going like that fast, the only thing you really see is this shape and the fact that this sword is moving. Cool. Uh, one thing that we can also talk about is sort of like for Beidou. What is she doing for this swipe? Um, there are a couple concepts, which is important animation right animation has a concept called anticipation follow through um, and these are things that help sort of sell weight in this situation anything that you have that is heavy you have to anticipate more in order to transfer energy to make the object move right so that's why in a lot of cases for claymore users which we're looking at now you'll see that their bodies are usually much more involved so you'll see them bend over more lean down more get down on their like legs a little bit more because you know assuming all things else consistent um because the weapon is heavier than something let's say like a, a single like a one arm sword you need to involve more of your body in order to make something move and i mean scientifically that would be sort of like newton's law but in this situation, for example, if there was something very heavy, you need more time and more energy to cause it to move. And in this situation, it's to change momentum, right? So in order to sell weight, you get the character to move into a much more drastic pose, like Beidou here, where she goes very, very low. And this pay the question here is sort of like, what does this pose for Beidou communicate? And in this situation, her butt is over this foot. So technically speaking, her overall weight is over this foot, but if we take into account the weapon, we can sort of imagine her center of weight being like over here, right? Kind of like almost over this foot. So then what she needs to do is she needs to move her her weight to the right first, causing this to swipe. Make sense? Because there's no reason for this sword to go first. 
when we're animating, there's um, this core idea of what is leading and what is following. And for inanimate objects, obviously, if you have a person, I'll draw a stick figure, you have a sword, the thing that is causing things to move is this person, not the sword. So to get the sword to move, person has to move first, sword moves second. Make sense? Um, so in this situation, for this sword to move in this direction, you need Beido to move in that direction first, or have something to cause this sword to move. Jesus, this is so, so disgustingly messy. Like, can you even understand what I'm drawing here? But simple thing is, we take her root, you move her root forward first, then her arms will swing this way, causing this weapon to swing. Um, and what we want to do is we want to transfer the foot weight from this foot to this foot, right? Cool. And you can see here, um, it's a little bit interesting in this situation because our camera is tracking the center of the character. So unfortunately, if, if this were to be better, it would be like this would stay here and then you'd see her whole body go in this direction. But because we are tracking this with her, it's a little bit different, but you get the idea. So you can see that her weight, her butt, is moving forward between these two feet, right? And so at this point, instead of being back here, it's in the middle. Cool. And then one thing to note also, for example, if the sword is gonna go swipe this way, right? In this arc, then if she is bent forward this way, you're gonna want her back. If she's facing this way and she's facing down, you're gonna eventually want it to go like this, right? She was gonna go back to cause this arch. But I think what's interesting about this, right, is if it was really heavy and she was just going to finish one auto attack, boom, this pose here is probably the most extreme in terms of her being like, oh, this is very heavy, so I'm countering the weight by pulling back this way as I'm swinging this up. But you'll notice that the frame, immediate frame after, she's already lowering her weight and then facing forward with her shoulder and lowering her, her, her upper torso. And this is immediately because she's getting ready to go into the next animation. And so what's interesting about, thank you for the follow, Nori Cat. I think what's interesting about this pose here is that it's not just a settle pose. It is a settle pose, but it is also a ready pose for the following, following thing. Um, it is a very non-passive pose because this has about the same energy as this pose in a way. It's just slightly reversed. That way the transition of energy is a little bit better, a little bit more smooth. If she were to like come this way and then settle on her back foot and all this stuff and relax a lot, then when you when you cue into the following animation, it feels very like sudden right but we have to remember that this pose is not only going to transition into the next attack but will transition into the the i have weapon idol and then sheath right but we can sort of break this down as like this would be like one antic pose i would say maybe this one would be a passing pose this would be a hit pose in this situation and then you sort of have it like a follow through four pose, but you can see what's funny about this is that in some other situation, you might would be able to be like, swords out here. And then like, boom, it goes all the way across. And there are some, I think if you look at some game demo reels, there are a lot of characters that like swing and then uh, have a lot of settle and swing uh, and have a lot of hit and have a lot of settle, right? But this one is actually very conservative with its application where the follow through blends a little bit into sort of like a ready antic pose into the next one. What is a passing pose? Um, that's a good question. I use the term passing pose basically as a mechanic to sort of describe if you have one extreme poses, um, like between this one and this one. So you have like antic into hit, theoretically, a passing pose is a breakdown pose, um, but essentially, as you would, as you are describing Love Strut, it is a transition pose to sort of describe exactly what's happening between this pose and this pose. Um, a lot of times, you don't need to author 
a passing or transition a transition pose uh but for some people it's it's nice to sort of delineate that because you can sort of establish exactly how fast is your root moving versus how how fast your feet are moving and your sword is moving transition is not always the best word to use especially for game animation mainly because transitions are technically separate authored exports so in this situation for example if we were talking about league of legends we have idols and runs and then as we mentioned before if we're just transitioning between an idol and a run it basically blends right it just blends now if the position that you chose the idol and the position you chose the run to be in are too different perhaps you need to author a custom animation that is a transition animation that would then basically make the motion into that new pose or new run feel a little bit more natural right does that make sense you know what maybe we can do that i have some examples here since i'm on my computer you guys are going to see some old ugly work for uh, for league but this will basically illustrate the idea i think Okay, so this is what we're going to be looking at quickly. Um, so I was able to work on Dark Cosmic Jin's locomotion stuff, most mainly. Da, 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 da. Uh, this concept was done by Simon. Simon Dubuque. You just Google him and you'll find his stuff. All right. So this is the idle in that I worked on in the beginning. And you can see that in the... Be uh, you First off, we have to get rid of the cloth because that's really annoying to work with in the beginning when you're ideating. So we started without it. And here I did an idle in, which is basically a transition, as we sort of talked about, um, an animation that sort of gives you a more believable... Basically, it's an animation that plays in between two animations, if that makes sense, right? Animation A, animation B, transition is something that plays in between. There was a transition that we wanted for Jin, which was basically to sort of communicate that, oh, he has this ability to fly and float because he's from space, right? He's this godly entity that destroys and creates space-time in a way, or planets, right? Um, so this was a very early blocking of his, of his idol in, into idol. Now, you can see that in his idol, compared to his run that I gave him here, they match decently. Um, like you could transition from A to B pretty well, right? But you can see here that with this idle in, he has a couple extra things baked in, right? He has a floating up into a down where he has contact pose straight, comes down, he's bent knees, his arms come in, and then the arms come back out, right? So this kind of information that you get in transition, um, a transition animation in this situation, right, is uh, communicating a lot more information as opposed to just transitioning from a pose to a pose. So. This is a storytelling moment of, oh, he's floating down, he has weight, so he sits down, and then comes back up. And then you can see a lot of this extra stuff, which is his arms start out like this, they come down like this, and they come back out for a settle, right? Boom. And then you have your normal idol, where he just like does this thing, idol variant, where he has the same loop, but looks around, has a couple of head cocks. You know, Jin has always been this kind of creepy guy with the mask, so having a little bit of that. And his variant too which some people are familiar with, but he looks at a star, creates it, throws it away, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Um, But this is a run. We didn't go with this 100% because I think people have kind of found him walking with his arm in his back a little bit too weird. But one thing for Jin, I think that was really, really common that we wanted to keep from his previous base skin, uh, at least in this legendary, is like strong, strong lines. Strong lines for his arms and his legs. And one thing to remember is that when you're animating this, there's going to be a big poncho on top. So if you can consider a big V formation right here, then figuring out how to get this leg and this leg and this arm to read as he's walking is is a big, big important thing to remember. Uh, but you can see here, for example, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't address here, which is like this arm. There's no bend on the elbow. There is no motion on this little thing here. Um, and that's because all that information isn't 100% necessary to communicate this specific type of walk, right? This one is sort of like sort of casually strolling, but with like very big strides, something with a little bit of confidence, self-assuredness. Um, and one thing that's a little bit interesting with this too is that um, once you put this in the game, you get feedback from other one, everyone saying whether or not it feels like base gen. And it's interesting because animators try very hard to make characters feel different in the legendary skins, or at least the animations feel different in, anima in the legendary skins. 
but a lot of times it's tricky because if we make them too different then everyone's like it doesn't feel or read like that character right Jin is a little bit easier I think because he's very very unique and has pretty he's like one of the very skinny characters in League and then has like you know okay he has like a mask face a big thing here big pauldron has very skinny legs and arms and then I guess anything on top is like maybe cloth um, as long as it kind of hits those things I think you get the green light and it's okay uh, the run fast is basically the same this one again the arm is back here the final version obviously doesn't have the arm in the back but you can tell basically in this situation the only difference here is he's hunched over a little bit more facing forward because when you're running and you're moving faster you need your weight to be in front of your basically more in front right running is basically just continu continuous falling with your legs catching you right um, but then also you can see here that when you're walking um, you can choose to do emotions that are a little bit more conserved when you're running uh, one thing to note when we're animating these uh, these different speed variances ones is that when people are running for our game it feels good to sort of have more of a bounce because then you can feel that they're putting effort into each step so you'll notice that at least for this run versus this run walk uh, the up down motion like this woo -woo 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 -woo, is not as pronounced um, there's that as well as for example the contact points for these are very different so i would say for the walk here contact pose like this it's very straight very straight when you go to the run the contact point is like this where it's like bent and almost contacting and this has already pushed off so in terms of its uh contact pose here these are some pretty big differences and then that basically carries how this kind of run would feel honestly the change in animation is the biggest draw for me with legendaries i find it hard to even play Soraka without hers on for example cool no I appreciate that that's really nice I do think that at least for legendaries animations on her on the kit is something that people look at a lot but to my knowledge I do feel like um, based on numbers I think um, a lot of skins actually do well based on how good their VFX are and sound are compared to the animation recall at least for 1350s but Dawnbringer, Nightbringer for Soraka is a very nice skin, mainly because uh, everything was touched and it was quite nice. What is my opinion on knee tracking during runs? So in this situation, if you track knees, we can see that right here. The tracking on it is not perfect. Um, the tricky thing with 3D is that 3D has a lot of technical limitations and applications for the work, right? Uh, in 2D animation, you basically are in command of every single thing as you're animating, right? So every single fingertip, every single knuckle, every single thing. And essentially when you're drawing, you're just tracking all those things. In real life, obviously things don't happen in perfect arcs. Um, they tend to try to, but real life elasticity and real life uh, you know, friction and everything causes everything to move as a system. We as animators don't sim our own work if we're keyframing, right? So we have to sort of manage all that stuff ourselves. And in this situation, if we're talking about knee tracking, my philosophy on it is actually don't track knees until you're polishing. And when you're polishing, if you're tracking knees, make sure that the knees 100% follow nice arcs, even if it kind of messes up your leg shape. Now, I'm not saying, for example, if you have a straight, then you should change the straight to not be straight. But if you have a straight, that should be a key pose for your knees and anything to sort of get your knees to follow a very nice arc or something and then have really nice spacing so that it like slows in and slows down and stuff. Yeah, you should do it. I think if you can and you can afford to, you should. Because that even gives you more of a 2D feel in that sense, right? Like maybe there's a little bit of elasticity and maybe the straight leg stretches and as long as it's within reason, it should be fine. The, what makes an animation in 3D look and feel smooth is if you can look at almost any single point on a character, like let's say the heel, the toe, the knee, the back, the elbow, the wrist, and the tip of the head and the shoulder. If at any point you can track any of these and they're all smooth according to their arc, timing, and spacing, then you're golden. Everything will look and feel very polished, right? Um, this is not counting any of those animations that you do that have to transition over one or two frames for game impact style. That's a little bit different. But if we're talking about like a run cycle, I'd say it's very valuable. Um, and obviously a polish point. Thank you for the question, Dr. Flapjack. Uh, and then we go to haste. And so the biggest thing you can see here, actually, when we start with this one, this is one of the contact points or a passing pose. And then we go to contact like this. 
this is a pretty like neutral one where it's like I guess the, the leg is like this and the foot's like this, right? You go to the haste. This one is even bigger. It's like, oh, I'm running really fast. And I'm like going really hard. So in this situation, everything is being pushed, right? Because velocity is higher. Energy needs to be expended more. So you have something slightly more dynamic. And you can even see here that his bounce is even higher, right? And then for home guard, we kind of concepted this thing where he's just floating. The final version is a little bit different from this, but for purposes of communicating the idea that we want basically three different runs, a normal one, a fast one, and a fat and a really, really fast one, uh, on top of a home guard that he floats and basically is like moving through planets and space, then um, this was that idea. And then we have one extra one, which is a slow. I don't have too much to say about this one, but I think because this slow, it's interesting. So when you're moving really fast, your root, if we're looking at a graph and this is like front to back and you have a root, your root kind of like does a figure eight, but a very small one. Uh, it goes over your left foot, it goes over your right foot. But then when you're running really slow or moving really slow, a lot of times like this one, your, your, your hips move in a much bigger figure eight. So you notice here, for example, his stance here is very wide, and each time he takes a step, his root goes to that side over this foot, and then to this side over on this foot. And then, because the arms are not involved in this situation, they are just following. So when he moves to the left, they drag it to the right. When he moves to the right, they drag to the left, and then they just go back and forth, back and forth. And again, I think for blocking purposes, you'll notice that not all of this is very perfect. I didn't do anything on the elbows really, and this arm, for example, is always bent. Um, all I did really was just like animate the shoulders here, it, like in this direction and then this direction. Uh, but again, for purposes of sort of doing a pass and showing, hey, this is the idea that I want to do for this character, and do people agree with the idea, this is perfectly fine. All this, all the special like small details that animators care about, which is like tracking everything, making the poses perfect, getting offsets, getting asymmetry, and everything to be appealing, and no clipping. That stuff, you know, you can you can deal with on your own time. But in this situation, to get guidance from your team, because you have tons of people working on the skin, right? You have a concept artist, an audio person, a modeler, a QA person, the more animators, getting stuff in front of your team and just talking about it early is really important anyway this was sort of the, the first main point that we were talking about was this transition that we had in the beginning where he comes up and comes down so this remember if you didn't have that this flow up to down to up back to idle you would just get a transition from this pose um, to something like this pose back and forth right and in some cases that's okay in some cases you want to do a little bit more storytelling so So I think there's a couple of interesting ones here too for Beidou. Let's see, for example. So we talked about sort of this swipe and then this reset. And then she goes into this one, which is cool. And I think what's really interesting about this is you can notice here, let's look at the appropriation of how much we sit on a pose. So let's classify this pose by its silhouette. Its silhouette is her right foot is back straight, her left foot is holding her weight, and she's leaning forward with the broadsword sort of like in this position. We can see that, for example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, basically nine poses, nine frames, it's held in that pose, right? Why? And then you see here, one, two, three. Over three poses, it goes from that, that overall pose into this. Now, obviously, you can see she lifts her leg, and that's like a small detail, but I think if you look at this overall, from this pose here to this pose here, it generally reads the same. It's definitely obviously a little bit different because it animation every frame sort of you move unless it's like film where you can stylize it but at least in game the whole point of making it feel like oh nine frames it's not really moving means it's storing up energy as it's moving and then on the release boom comes down right so if we appropriate we have nine frames of sort of like moving hold antic 
right into the boom, the follow through, bah, and then the follow through happens of overshooting and settling. So it's like nine frames over three frames over, let's see how, how long this is. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay, so about 19. 9, 9, 3, 19. All right, so one idea, one core idea here really is the fact that, for example, especially for games, a lot of times it's about the pose. This pose is important, and this pose is important. And this is just a passing. And this is this is like the the swipe, the actual swipe. Um, and so in games, one thing that we always think about is that it's actually more important for the antic, and then the settle, or I, I guess in this situation, the follow through. Follow. Oh, I can't spell English. Follow through. Horrible spelling that's going up the side. All right, apologies. But you can see basically the ratio here, right? It's that this is a big number, this is a really big number, and this is a small number. So for gameplay purposes, this swipe is where the damage happens. But the whole point here is that this nine, especially for games, is where you sell weight. This 19, for animation is where you also sell weight, but you have to understand that um, you can cancel out of this 19, right? Because in this situation, I mean, okay, if we take a look at like Monster Hunter, then yeah, you sit on this 19 for a long time or even more, right? Depending on the weapon. But for games like Genshin that have to be very fast paced and you just like swipe, 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 and you need a little bit of selling. Uh, this also includes for League of Legends. Big heavy characters, generally speaking, have similar attack speeds to mage characters or small characters overall of course there is a slight difference but to keep parity within the game most of them are pretty similar um, you can't get too far different you sell most of the way through here in the antic in the beginning and then the follow through and everything at the end it can actually be terminated early because the player wants to do the freaking next attack right in this animation recording that i did it we kind of sit on this a little bit just because we can get to, we get to observe it um, where you can see here she hits, the hair is here, there's cloth, they go like wiggle, wiggle, wiggle because there's air, and then they also settle down slowly. Um, you can, But then obviously I don't let it rest the entire time. And we go straight into the next one. Cool. And I think it's the same thing here, right? Like it follows the same principles as the second attack and the first one. But what's interesting about this, it has an extra layer of spin to it, right? It has twisting in the torso and a spin in the leg that causes a spin in the weapon and so you go from uh you go from like this uppercut into a down cut into a spin attack whoo, which is like down up down sideways sort of and for a third so in terms of combo it's like simple first one simple but more impactful second one flourishing third one are you able to tell if the clothes are simulated or animated by hand? Um, it is a mix, um, in my opinion. These are not 100% sim sims, but they are sort of posed at certain points. And so... I, it's hard to answer your question, I feel like, in some cases, um, at least in this situation, mainly because how much simming. Um, some, for, some, for example, some studios have tools that don't sim, per se, because simming is a little bit tricky, where you have to put it through like a, a renderer, and then it has to calculate over time, and then output something and render it, and then give it to you, and then like all the follicles of everything touching any kind of surface will then happen. But Genshin Impact doesn't work that way. Genshin Impact has like a bone here, a bone here, a bone here, and a bone here or something and maybe there's some tool that kind of calculates offsetting that is applied to it possible um but in my head i feel like there is an element of it where for example if this was simmed you would probably see that this cloth is like draped around her foot but when she spins it kind of lifts a little bit and you get like a very nice appealing arc here um 
I I want to say that based on what I see here, because animation style is so anime esque, that it is like half half. It's posed out, but it has some sort of script or thing running to help to help animators do like offsetting on it. Is is my take. Though, I will admit, actually, I could be wrong. I have seen a lot of, like, Eastern studios, um, specifically Chinese and Korean. Uh, Chinese and Korean studios that are teaching students to do cloth. And I've seen a lot of game demo rows on YouTube, if you search them, that all our cloth is insane. It's, like, moving all the time, and it's, like, will billowing in the wind. And honestly, I don't know how they, like... I can't tell. Like, maybe it is hand-keyed, and they just have a very, very good process for doing it, or... Honestly, like in my opinion, it's not like realistic cloth, but it is nice curvy cloth that feels like cloth. So I can't tell if it's 100% script or engine helped or if it's like there's just a methodology that they have that sort of gets the samey old feel. And I kind of actually get a little bit of that feel in, in the Genshin Impact cloth, a little bit, but I cannot say for sure. Can I ask what program you're viewing this in? I am viewing this in uh, Keyframe Pro. Let's look at this spin attack. Okay, also I apologize. We are going very, very slowly. We were supposed to kind of look at all of these these guys. So we're gonna go through just Beidou's like full set quickly. And then we're gonna look at the other ones just to like get a impact of each, like uh, overall view. But if we look at this one. Woo! Okay, so what's, what's this, there's something interesting here too. Everything that's happening, especially here, She's leading with her root and her foot. So this leads first, and then this catches up after. So again, the reason why this feels nice, body goes first, then weapon. Body continues going first, then weapon. But there's an interesting texture thing here that's, I think, pretty interesting, which is things are going fast and quick at different times. For example, the way that Beidou comes in from this pose into this pose is very fast, but then she sits in this pose a little bit, kind of holds it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six for six frames, right? You have a little bit of moving action with this leg and this foot and this weapon spinning, um, because obviously heavy weapons, for example, need to like have even spacing, but the character themselves can do quite cool things. So the, f the main read that you get is this planted foot with a leg out and this, and then most of the animation that happens is just like spinning on that axis. What's cool is that this goes pretty fast, but then you hold into this sort of local moving pose, go really fast into a spin, boom, and then hold into this local pose. If we do the same breakdown, it's probably very similar with a little bit of varied texture. Um, actually, let's just look at that. Two, three start here 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 14 15 16 17 18 okay i would say 18 ish 18 1 2 3 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 so you have 18 and then you have a 10 ish but this 10 is broken by 3 7 because you have seven for anti, like slow moving in into the actual swipe, which is right here for one, two, three. And then you have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, 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 so this variation here is a little bit different. The actual like hit is around this three farm three frame window and then the 24 after. And then I messed up here. We have the same thing, but then we have this cool swipe. I think what's interesting is just like Okay, actually the last one is cool. So, one thing to note here that we have been talking about, right? I think it's interesting to see exactly how each, I think, uh, Beidou, I'm and Beidou and all of these animations goes from like a, a like rest pose into some sort of active like jump or like active shift in momentum to help, help move the entire thing. 
first one is like she's down here but she moves from back foot to forward foot and she slides forward next one she does a spin to the left or to to her to her left nope i redo this attack second one she spins to her left and then she goes from back foot to forward foot and really knees down kneels down this one she does a spin jump onto her other foot and spins through that transferring weight into her front foot again this other one she does this cool hop actually from down up hop shifts forward to go onto her back foot here and then puts this leg out to catch her weight and save where she's going to go forward uses her full body weight to press forward her head is actually communicating the direction um actually that's one thing that i think is really um a small detail that's really nice in animations that people can do is for the entire character one of the biggest things that help communicate intention especially if you are not staring at the face or something is the head the head out of the entire character communicates what they're thinking so for example in this situation if she was like staring up here and her head was up you would think that she's you would imagine or believe that she's going to do something towards the sky or that's what she's thinking about but because her head's down and when she's moving her head is continually to go down it's showing her attention to sort of that direction right and also the fact that like her head is still down and her body's still down that just shows like how much intention is on this down part right obviously if you wanted to you could have it actually facing this way as this kind of thing but there is also sort of a badassness of just like staring down for your like the intention of force and then everything else happens around you right kind of like uh not looking at the explosion behind you but i think it's more clear here where it's like she's facing this way first to the wall but then you can see intentionally here the biggest thing that's leading as she does her hop to set the foot forward her upper torso and head are showing you where she's going to go right the only thing that's happening here is the foot are the foot is getting ready to be placed so it's ready to catch the the full attack this weapon is raising a little bit but then her op her op body for the for these three frames is going first, and then this weapon follows after. Does her foot even touch this? It does almost. Okay, and the last one that most people like is kicking the sword, kicking the weapon, and smashing down with it. But let's see. And this is a blending thing. For example, this pose. This pose really don't have too much breakdown in terms of the poses that were given to it. So this is just blending, in my opinion, from what I can tell. The engine is just blending from point A to point B. But then at this point, she's facing this direction. So what happens? She's already on her foot. She's going to swing this foot around to kick this up as her body resets to face forward, and then it swings down. So in that sequence, right? Kick. Body starts turning, and then sword comes down. And again, we sort of talked about this before. Sword here. Swipe happens like this, and you'll notice again that the swipe is completely not lined up with this whole thing. But the way that we read this, the way that we read this action, right? You read it in that rhythm, right? It goes kick, kick into swipe, kick swipe, kick swipe, and so. You get a kick with this air air wind coming out, which is a very nice touch. But once that beat reads, this swipe, the sword itself is not important. What's important is this big swipe that, you know, takes care of the whole thing, right? Um, but yeah, in this situation for her, her last attack and her sequence, she does a very interesting spin into a kick onto her weapon. At least from what I can tell, it's a kick on her weapon. Like right here, like dunk, comes up, comes down. I kind of feel like it would be kind of cool like if we're looking from this angle right obviously we're not normally not looking from this angle but if she's gonna kick it i feel like this kind of leg doesn't have to come down like this it could like stay straight for most of the time maybe at this angle and like maybe a little bit and i think for animation purposes for me i would actually like keep it straight here straight here when she comes down here this leg would like kick out a little bit faster but 
um, it may not be the case because she's doing this thing. And there's a very interesting anime thing where you can do where it's like the sword is really big, boom, here. And then you have like the character like up here and its feet are like up or something. The anime thing to do is like 100% of, of this character's weight is transferred into the sword or something. Dr. Flapjack says, would you simplify the left arm motion during the kick move? It seems a little to bounce left, right, uh, and back left really quickly. Yep, I would, but I would have to, uh, I'm going to point out here again, I think it's just a blending issue that they didn't, they didn't take care of. So for example, this pose, from my understanding, this is where the animation is starting, right here, uh, for this last fifth attack. And if you track the arm from here, it goes back into this. I think it's fine, right? Because what she's doing is she's anticking to this, and you kind of need this where for this leg to come forward, you need this to twist the other direction. And that's okay. But there is, as you mentioned, arm here it comes this way and then back this way and then back this way so theoretically maybe the arm stays back here as you were pointing out maybe and stays here i think that would be cool but i do think it might look weird in some cases because then i think the more important part of the physiology of how you would move comes from this pose to that pose. Uh, yeah, I think maybe for like, I mean, if we were working on this, right? I think if you and I were working on an animation like this, I would say maybe try experimenting by deleting this arm animation and keeping it in this position the entire time, or at least locally on this space, because then it's not distracting from the leg. Because I think maybe then the leg would be like the biggest read, right? So this leg comes out, it swings over, boom. Then the arm swings after. I think that would be worth testing to see if that works. Granted, in the grand scheme of things, almost makes no difference. But I do, I do think think that would be a detail that could possibly make if things feel slightly more smooth or slightly more clean. I really like this this thing though. This motion. Wow, so cool. So I think one of the reasons why this is cool is because this shows a lot of times when you're doing weight for auto attacks like this, it's sometimes hard to track this weapon's center of mass. And in a lot of cases, because it's attacking so fast, you could just replace this with any kind of weapon that fill, fills this void here. Like if you wanted to, it could be like a big mace or something and you'd get the same effect right because we are doing hyper stylized moves um and again what we're doing here is we're trying to hit believability as opposed to realism right um poof poof i think it's hard to sort of really appreciate the small details of the weapon itself um but what's so fun about these sheathing animations is that this is an opportunity where gameplay it doesn't need to be fast you just take it slow and the slower you take it you're actually able to put in more detail, as in where is it rotating from and all that stuff. Now, this is a front view, so it's not a side view, but we can still look at it here. You can see here that the rotation for this thing is all happening around here, which is perfect, in my opinion. Um, yes, it's supposed to be like heavy like this, right? But I think what's interesting is I think if, if anyone ever has a sword like this, one thing to note is that if it's like super heavy on this side, right? If it's super heavy on this blade side and you have to hold it like right here, there's no way you're going to be able to like hit stuff and use this weapon if this, this handle is like that short. If you put your two hands here like this and you have this weight, which is like what, like three times heavier, then it's not going to work. Like, do you have the wrist muscles or the cat, like the forearm muscles to like offset this entire amount of like weight? 
So I think for a lot of cases, what happens is for weapons like these, you have a pommel and the pommel is very heavy. And then this weapon is actually a little bit lighter on this end and heavier nearer to the hilt, which is why I think for, for example, if you have a long sword, one of the reasons why you have a sword here is to add weight and balance, as well as obviously having guards for your hands when people were fighting, because then you'd have clashing here, I think. But in a lot of cases, the longer your sword is, the longer you need your hilt to be, right? So that way you can put hands here. But because it's a stylized um, thing, I think it's just a really nice detail where you can see most of the detail here is like designed around this hilt. And therefore you can assume that sort of like a lot of the weight is around this area. And so when she's spinning, it centers around there. And that's not, some, that's not a detail that you really get um, from, from all the other stuff. But on top of that, like you can see that when she's doing it, she's holding it here with this arm and then holding the weight of this side with this hand and basically twirling it around this axis. Oh, that's cool too. Do you notice how when she puts like this way and this one? Oh, well, one thing that's really cool about this is that like all the spinning happens within a very, very narrow thing, right? All this spinning and stuff is done within this very narrow space. And so visually from the front, at least, it's like, it's very neat. It's very compact. And then there's a small detail here that you probably that most of us will never notice and don't notice but when she spins with this way just look at her uh, it's her left hand but screen right hand this one right here so she lets go of it and her palm is facing to the left side but then when she comes up here she actually helps push the weapon up like this with the back of her palm back of her hand like that and actually it's funny because it's like riding it's riding this side but then she opens her hand this way to catch it on the on the on the upswing i think physically that's not possible like in real life like you'd really have to like set your 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 like wrist on this but just from a detail perspective it's really cute spin open hand back hand push anchor comes up open hand receive invert the weapon and then what's cool here if we were to do this in real life, you would do a spin. This would go up, but then the sword is already falling because it's really heavy. So it would just go like straight down. But in animation, right, we always want to do things where we hold believability and poses so that it reads. And so what happens here is that w even though it has already reached its straight down pose, you hold it up a little bit. Just to say like, I finished spinning it and I'm going to stab it in now. This pose you can see here, you're fully expecting it to go down, but you just hold a couple extra frames, right? I think it's like if you talk about acting or like stage presence, it's people who know how to hold the moment just long enough, right? Just for appeal's sake. Obviously not too long, not too short, just right, right? Um, so she holds it up, then strikes it down. And there's an interesting thing here too. You always want a couple actions together, I think. To make things feel cohesive and appealing for example right here she could just smack it down right straight down and then you'd be done because normally if you have like a stick let's say you know you guys have all been hiking maybe i don't know maybe we're all indoor people don't go outside ever <laughs> but let's say you go hiking you have a hiking stick right you can imagine you have a stick on your left hand and you're smashing it up and down your body itself is not really shifting position right go up go down go up go down blah blah blah, blah if you're just standing but for us, when we're looking at someone do the same action, you want to feel like it's tied together and not just something, one thing is moving. When you're taking a recording of someone doing it, you'll notice very, 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 very minute details of the person like shifting weight, rotating their chest, their clavicle comes up and their hand goes up and the, the, the point at which it's touching the stick is like sl slowly rotating or changing. In animation, because sometimes those small details don't get tracked, if we have to to attend to all of those details, one of the biggest things then is just to just add a new pose. Like right here, Beidou, I'm Beidou. is like front facing us, her chest is facing this way, she's looking at the sword a little bit, her hand's out here. And then when she smashes it down, she turns this way, hands out, face forward. It's basically just an, like a inverted pose kind of not not really inverted but just like a new pose right something different 
But then you couple that with putting the sword down and it feels nice, right? Because the whole body is involved. A lot of times if we were to animate just the arm moving or something, then it's like, Bleh. it doesn't feel right because everything's too localized, right? KiwiKi asks, KiwiKi TV asks, do you film references for every animation you work on? I do not. Um, I do know a lot of animators at work and friends that do use reference. I personally, well, I should say, I do not film reference of myself often. I have before, a couple times. And I think reference is a very, very, very useful tool. It is um, a good way to, for example, I mean, we can look at game reference, right? Like you can look at a video game and look at their animations that they've done to use it re as reference. But the big problem with that is that that is already a distillation of perhaps an interpretation of real life, right? So it simplifies, simplifies ideas, it changes certain aspects, and also takes stylistic liberties in terms of what they want to do. So real life reference should be done if you are looking for key poses or information to better inform your work and ground it in realism, if that makes sense. It definitely should not be used unless you're rotoscoping for style purposes, in my opinion, to be used as a crutch to one-to-one -one transfer work or an idea, in my opinion. There are obviously some workflows that I think are fine, where people translate a lot of their work uh, film themselves and sort of animate themselves doing something and then they do another pass and sort of change things to sort of make it feel a little bit better. My role here is not to, to criticize other people's workflow because I work my specific way. I don't like recording myself because I hate looking at myself in reference, but it is a very useful tool. And for example, if people learn better by doing that, I think it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly a useful way of animating. If anything, if I have to be honest, I could probably do reference more of myself um, because there are situations and there are certain areas of my approach that are weak in terms of understanding fully how body mechanics work um, but again i think if you're still learning or you're still trying and even i am still learning and trying uh, try different types of sources of inspiration different references different ways of working and basically just use what works for you done We've looked at Beidou. Uh, let's quickly look at Chong Yun and Noel. Oh wow, okay, so so here you can see this, right? So fum. Fum. He actually has a couple of similar things as Beidou, where he holds this last pose right before he stabs it down, right? But then the way that he brandishes it, like he and Beidou, Beidou holds it like sideways, I think, and he holds it up. When you have a character that holds like a weapon more up like this, this usually means that they have more upper body strength to hold it like that for longer. Whereas if a character is holding something like across, across their body like this, where it's heavy, it means they're weaker upper body, which, I mean, not to say that Chung Yun has a more upper body strength than Beidou, but um, it is definitely more associated with masculine qualities overall, I think. Perfectly fine, I guess. Um, but you'll notice here that when he brandishes it into his put away spot, he does it as like a circle swipe. And he uses his entire body. Do you see how he uses his entire body right there? Uh, he's really trying. He's trying hard. He's working. He's working hard. Uh. Again, remember, we're talking about body leading first, everything follow after. So you can see here. He's gonna swing it to the. He's gonna swing it on the left side, but that's already ha okay because it's on the left side, right? So he doesn't have to do too much on that to do whatever. He wants to swing it all the way around, so he shifts his foot over the shifts his weight over the appropriate foot. In this case, screen right. He shifts his body over in that direction, Boom. and then his body has to counteract and continuously lead the f upcoming motion to complete the swing. Very cool. All right, but we look at his actual animations. Whoa, 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 whoa. He's very forward, he leans very forward, and we talked about head down, head found. He's showing that I'm gonna do this motion. He's facing this way, and at the end, okay, let's look at the let's look at the vector of his foot. His vector foot is this way, vector foot this way, 
his root is this way and his body is facing this way. So there's a lot of twist here in the body, which I think is pretty nice. It's a pretty nice detail. But it comes from here. And then he transfers weight onto his back foot and hops up. Nope, he transfers weight onto his front foot, but his front foot goes backwards. As he goes forward to a spin, foot catches himself. It's actually pretty interesting. I feel like a lot of um, Chong Yun's poses are actually quite like dynamic. Maybe this perspective I chose is not that great. I feel like these poses here would look pretty nice from from behind and top down, which is the, which is the normal cam. But for the first attack was facing backwards. This attack is facing backwards just on the opposite side. Still in character. Whoa, that is underhand. Okay. Underhand. That's pretty interesting. So the blade is facing this direction here and then he brings it around to do an underhand. Whoa. Underhand spin with a jump to double brand it to like double hand brandish kick foot contact kick down. Wow. Nice. Oh. Spin into jump air. This one's really cool, I think. And then he does a spin. You can see here, for example, this is the last pose. This is probably first pose, blending. Here, when he does the spin, he only has only done a 360 spin, but with VFX helping, this VFX swirl that shows this, it makes it feel like he did some sort of like energy collecting spin thing, boom, that happens a little bit faster. It just helps with clarity. Um, this is the this is one of those concepts for animation that I think is really important, which is like just look at shapes, look at shapes and motion, and those are your strongest bets. So anything that you have on your character that is big and noticeable or easy to read, really understand that that's what people will see. So those are the things that you want to look out for. And if you can make those things be the most impactful, then that's the best. Basically, you want to lead, you want to lead your viewer's eyes. But this is cool because you can notice here, he takes his right foot is, his right foot is forward. His left foot comes forward, kicks, steps on his left foot, and he raises his right foot right here. So he's sitting on this foot as he, dude, he's so flexible. Holy shit. His foot's here. Legs here, straight up here, it's right here. He's do basically doing splits. But off this foot, you see it's flat, it's bent. If you wanted to stylize it, you could probably bend a little bit more where it's like this and then his roots a little bit lower. But, and then extension right here, very cool. To a spin, boom. Cool. You have contact comes down, goes down, and then, I mean, camera shakes messes everything up so I can't see, but you can probably assume his root comes down and then back up and a little bit down as he sort of bounces and slides forward because obviously very heavy. And so if you track the weapon, the weapon basically does a spin around here hold over here as it goes up straight down and that arc i think is pretty interesting that path of uh cool and then let's look at noel quickly wow okay so noel is also very different if we're being perfectly honest is the root the same as center of balance hey jay Paco, welcome uh root does not equal center of balance. Let us do a diagram. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Like this. And they're sort of falling over. Okay. 
God, this picture is horrible. Well, let's explain it this way. So this really shitty stick figure is basically, this is the root. The reason why this is called the root is because um, in this situation, if we have a character and there's a rig, there will be controls around each like element, something like this, I guess. Perfect. And this control is normally always called the root. And it's basically where your hips are. Um, this is just, I guess, in this situation, like conventional way of rigging, and it's called that. But in this situation, center of mass sometimes relates to the root. But if we're talking scientifically, center of mass is basically you take this whole character and where is the center of its mass? <laughs> supposedly like you know scientific term of like you take an amalgamation of something where does where is if you were to throw it in the air and it was to spin where would it spin from right it would be roughly around here i guess ish maybe here something like that for example if you have an object that's like this and it's really heavy center mass is probably around here if you have an object like this it's very long has a very heavy 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 end like this like a spike mace, the center of mass probably is around here. So in this situation, the root is is relating to a control uh, for the rig. And in this situation, most of the time, it refers to the hips of the character because that is where most animators animate motion from. I mean, if you think about it from a structural perspective as a human being, whenever you move, your hips generally are like the foundation where everything connects to. And when you're moving and walking, where are the pivots from? Your center of mass is basically depending on your orientation. If you're lying down, standing, moving, your center of mass dictates sort of where how you balance yourself. Uh, and you are correct. For example, when you're running, your center of mass is technically in front of you, right? If you're falling, your center of mass is somewhere where you don't want it to be, <laughs> essentially. Um, but yeah, for example, you're, you're, if you were to be standing, standing versus bent over, then your center of mass would be here, here-ish first, and then here. So as you have said, it is dynamic for the body is based on pose and posture, 100%. But I was going to say in this situation, Noelle actually, to me, she it looks like she's a lot more careful. She's not big with her motions. Um, two things and why this stands out, I think. If you look at her motions and where she's holding the weapon, a lot of the times it's always near her root. And it's always near her chest. I think it's much more noticeable on these last two attacks. The first two are much more generic in my opinion. They're just big swipes and they're fine. But what's interesting about it, you see here this one, this is not normal for the other ones, right? First attack, swipe, stays in this pose, right? Second attack, lifts and she, actually it's cute. She lifts it above her shoulder and she like uses her body. It's kind of like lifting a, a sack of rice. Yeah, she like lifts it over here and then she kind of I think she's I think it's interesting because she doesn't use her body here. It feels a little bit lighter because you can see here her body's not going down when she swipes down. She swipes first and then her body follows. So my assumption is someone else animated this one. But that's not we don't have to be critical about it, but it's just interesting to note here. So weapon goes first and then the body follows. And then actually when this once this pose has finished she does this like extra hop spin into this back. So we mentioned before that like when you attack, you go from right to left and some people do it like that, right? Right to left, left to right, but then you don't stay right. She actually just the hop and reverses back to left for some reason, which is actually quite interesting. Not sure why. Nothing wrong with it. I think for example, if you plan out your attacks, you're like, oh yeah, you want all of them to start left. For example, you could animate it so it's a swipe from left to right resets to left, swipe left to right, resets to left. If you want to, that'd be fine. That would be a character thing, right? But that's kind of cool, right? She does her swipe, swipe, and then hop back into reset. And what's cool is that that hop is actually part of her follow through. So you can see here, swipes down, her root goes down, and she kicks off her foot a little bit, so she's in the air. So actually when she flips over, she's still like in a mid jump. So she catches herself with her other foot, does like a nice graceful landing. 
And this is more, this is like a Chong Yun pose, right? Chong Yun had a Chong Yun. Which one? This one? Not that one. This one. That's almost the same. Sort of. Hers is more straight. Chong Yun was more angled in, like more active. Hers is a little bit more heavy. It, it almost looks like her, her, her shoulders are sagging a little bit. Just like oh, a little bit tired. And then here, this is where I think it stands out the most. When she swings, she swings with her hips. It's very hip oriented, not upper body, not head oriented, very hip. And then we can see she doesn't take her arms out and her weapon's not like on the outside. It just, it like locally stays within her, within her center of mass. And she uses that to rotate the weapon. Boom, right? It's, it's around her hip the entire time. Like one, two, three, all the way around. And she's like, she spins like that. Boom. Like it doesn't, it doesn't leave her hip area. It just, it's like glued, which is fine. Boom. Is she closing her eyes? She can't see. So scared. I actually have not played Noel at all, so I don't know anything about her voice line, her character, or her personality, but is she someone that's like scared or like introverted and like shy? Kind of feel like she might be kind of like the Hinata maid. Shy maid who wants to be a maid of <laughs> night. Okay, okay. Well, you know, we, we can't we can't crush a girl's dreams, right? Gotta let them do what they want. All right. So this is really cool because I think most of the other characters don't don't do this, right? She does this thing, and I think obviously she opens her eyes. She looks so sad, guys. She's like, oh, cool. And then I think the last one too is also, yeah. Okay, guys. Okay. So you see here. First off. This is very common in animation where I think for a nicer pose, it'd be nice to have like the offset of the hand and then have some extra finger poses to sort of like make it feel more natural. But as we're driving in animation, there's usually control here and the controls on the hand. And a lot of times the details of like whether or not your, your hand wrist is lined up with this thing like that. This detail is almost n not necessary to track just because everything moves way too quickly. Like, you know, we're spending freaking two hours just looking at the, like one and a half characters right now. And most of these animations happen within half a second when you're playing, so. But, what's interesting here is that when she's doing this, like Beidou and um, Chong Yun, I think a lot of the times what they do, their swords are out here. As in very active, very involved, and very broad, right? They're like, I'm, Broadsword user. I'm Claymore user. I'm gonna smack people. Actually, I'm very interested because I don't have a I don't have a five star broadsword user, so I'm very curious as to like what um, Deluke would be like. So I feel like Deluke might have really cool animations, but I've never never seen them. Boom. You can see here, like the sword where the center of the weight is. It doesn't come out here, right? Like boom, like that. It's literally where her body is the entire time. Boom. Which so these last two last two autos I think are very interesting because they're very they're actually a little bit different from the first two one two they're they're more close to this one's a little bit extended right her her arm is fully out um and it's also one handed so it feels a lot lighter here right this makes it feel so much lighter than this one where her whole body goes with it and it's also centered around her her waist and then this one too boom. You can see that, right? And the thing is, there's nothing wrong with these, right? Like when you're playing, it's still like a, a Claymore attack. Nothing wrong with it, right? But I think this is where it's like, if you observe and you think about it, like just the fact that there's a variance in timing and spacing, as well as the posing that carries the motion. I think this is exactly what animators have to struggle with and, and understand as we're working, which I continuously am always trying to understand because Trust me, I did, um, I never, I never admitted this publicly, but I worked on God, God King Garen's auto attacks as well as, well, no, I just worked on his auto attacks and I don't like them. They're horrible. <laughs> but, um, 
I worked on them for like two weeks and I like basically said I give up. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna finish this and polish it and just turn it in and just like never look at it again. Here an autos update. Okay, first off, this is like a semi semi almost finished version. But uh this I think is interesting in the sense that like uh this is a work in progress, first off. Don't at me. <laughs> Thank you for the follow, aka Zero Adam. Appreciate it. I think this video that I shared with the team, it was trying to figure out basically how much delay. Let me just let's look at it. Huh. Why did I make this video? I don't quite remember. You can see that I think in this situation the two the two auto attacks are a little bit different in the sense that like one one has a lot of more drag here. Like it, like it has a lot of more ease. It like goes goo, 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 whereas this one, it just like stops immediately almost. And there's a difference in terms of the sense of like control. If it's moving too, if it's moving too much, it's either it's really heavy and you're trying to control it, or if it goes really fast and stops moving, it means you have control. But then it kind of feels much more light, right? Because obviously, we have much more control over things that are lighter versus things that are heavier. Unless you're jacked, I guess maybe Garen is jacked. But the question in this situation is if you're, if you're auto attacking an Annie or something, the question is like, which one feels better when you're auto attacking? Man, these autos are not good. <laughs> uh, but I guess they're okay. Also, you notice here, for example, they swing left to right and then he does a reset, right? He swings to the right and then he does a, like a sword flip and then gets ready to hit hit again. It's interesting too because, you know, I authored this transition for him to go, oh, he swipes all the way across, flips the sword, gets ready with an antic and swipes again to the other side. When you're playing Garen, you're not sitting here autoing the Annie, right? So half the animation I did is usually not seen, mainly just because you're autoing and moving, right? That is definitely the general pattern and way it works. Why did we talk about that? I forgot. My brain is slowly frying. All right. If you don't mind me asking, how long does it usually take for you to complete an animation from start to finish? I would, I would, I know it would vary from animation to animation, but just curious. Um, an animation, depending on what you're doing, takes depends on, as you just mentioned, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, for a recall, I would say generally we're given between one to three weeks, depending on the complexity of the character. Um, I would say for my timeline. For, I can only speak for myself. I cannot speak for other people in their process, but for me, I would usually spend two days, roughly, to ideate on an idea by doing an ideation blocking. And if the team is like, yeah, this is does not not right, then you know, I'll go back and then spend maybe a day, another day on coming up with a new idea. And once like people are okay with it, I try to spline, uh, basically blocking plus it, spline it, and polish it. That process usually takes about three, four days maybe five so i would say between a week to two weeks for me generally speaking um when i worked on zaya and rakan zaya has a lot of extra secondary motion for her elderwood character skin well her whole character but the elderwood skin recall that i worked on one it had props two it had a lot of secondary motion and so that took me about a week and a half and then i had to do the dual recall which then took me a little bit longer and blah 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 it is tricky too because, for example, if we have a character, you'll notice, for example, in Star Guardian Ari, when I did the recall, Ari had nine tails, right? My shortcut was to just turn the nine tails into one tail. Because who wants to animate nine tails? Well, I mean, it would be fun to, sort of, but then you get sick of it very quickly. So Ari had nine tails and I basically combined them into one, so I only had to animate one for the recall. And she had a familiar, Kiko. And the question would be like, would you want to animate Kiko on top of the character with a tail? Uh, no, not entirely. Because if you think about it, a familiar or something basically acts as a second character, albeit not as complicated, but it does add time. Um, if any of you are animators, you will know that once you've finished the main animation, and then now you have to do all the extra things, you're like, cool, but when can I be finished? In the end, it's fun to do all the secondary stuff because it makes everything feel alive. But a lot of times if you're on a tight schedule and you're like, oh my God, I have to do another pass on this, another pass on this, another pass on this. Jibaka asks, when would you attack, when would the attack animation get canceled to switch to moving then? Boom. 
You mentioned that your attack animation wouldn't be seen most of the time since Karen would be oddly and moving in the game, not just constantly attacking Annie in place. Correct. And uh, when would the attack animation get canceled switch to movement? Oh, okay. So I know you play League, right? In uh, League, we have something like a trigger. Let's call this like event. Holy shit. <laughs> I was curious if there was a set cutoff point in the animation when Garen switches to a moving animation. Ah, good question. So I understand the system to a point that I, I can sort of work with it. I am not someone who dictates uh, these things or designs the animation engine. That is something that we are given. So I can only give my sort of impression of how it works because it is a black box and League is a very old game. But, so we have an event and this event will trigger something. And let's call this uh, attack. Please excuse my mouse handwriting. <laughs> attack. All right. And I guess we could color it like green. If I do this, can I, can I, can I? Yeah. All right. Here's the attack. And there is a specific range lock. Though actually there is also a frame here that I should put in here. Uh wind wind up win, win wimp wimp up wimp up win wind wind up and then you have basically extra okay so in this situation we author this full animation set which is basically this whole thing. Now, the way that this interacts with the game engine is designers author uh, in the character sort of a window here where the attack happens, then damage happens at this section, at this point. This windup is interesting because there is a small window where it'll start the cast for this thing but it will cancel if you put in a if you if you put in a trigger or like some other command this will this will cancel this will cancel this entire process um which is interesting you you've definitely obviously seen play people who cancel their auto attacks right it's basically like the precursor of the auto attack as you're doing it and when you put in a command before it happens it doesn't pull through right um, there's this small window right here. Then when it plays the rest of this, you are locked into it. So it will always 100% play up to this specific frame. We can call it F. Um, once it's past the windup lockout, it'll play the attack animation as well as do the effect and do the damage. And once that happens, there is a number or something. Um, I think actually it's a percentage. It is very weird. Um, the way that our characters are designed, I think it's like seconds or something. Not not frames, not any not frames or or anything. It's like seconds, and then percentage of seconds of lockout, if that makes any sense. So, uh, anyway, the attack runs, and there is a number percentage where you can finally, after it is unlocked, it is unlocked. You can move. If you try to cast a move, to, if a move command within this attack lock frame, like sequence, you cannot move. So this applies for both attacks and for spells. Um, so for example, when you're pl you're playing Lux and you throw a Q, you cannot move when you're throwing a Q. But once the Q of projectile has been cast, you can move. When you're ulting, you cannot move while ulting, but once the ult has actually fired, you can move. Now, a lot of times, just going straight into a run from this point into a run doesn't look good. It looks ugly. So animators are always like, okay, you've just done this big heavy attack and now you want to run or you want to go back to idle. 
But again, for things that move, animators want things to take time. And so a lot of times we author the full attack where you go back to idle or you go back to run. And um, in this situation, this is the spot where animators ha usually have um, a lot of character moment acting and stuff. But a lot of times, based on whether you choose to sit, stand, run, or all that stuff, you don't get to see any of it. Because you're basically going to go Q, W, E, run, all this other shit, right? When you're playing, that stuff doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, for the Garen effect, it's like Garen does this cool flip hand thing. But if you start moving, he just goes straight into his run, and you won't get to see the flip hand into the into the swipe from the other direction. Um, you know, and again, that's good. You only get to see half of my bad animation, so good, good. I don't mind. Um, there is. I can show a small video. Let us look at a video here. All right, we've been streaming for a bit. My voice is getting worse and worse right now. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Um, for those of you who have not seen this video, uh, How do we stop you can, but I am quickly first. going to... Delay. Um. Does this change for each champ as well? I assume these windows also change as characters increase attack speed. Correct. Uh, it is different for every champion. It is coded differently. Um, I mean, obviously some champions probably are coded the same, um, but technically it's unique for everyone. And yes, it probably does scale with attack speed. All right, so I think it's this video. Um, but if you haven't seen this, I basically go over my process for Omega Squad Vagar, and I believe there's a section. Please tell me I do. Yep. So right here you can see. Um, You notice that, for example, when you do it, when you do a spell cast, um, <clears throat> uh, characters, if you're doing an ability, have have this description on the bottom that tells you what ability what ability you're casting, and you'll see that it's a wind up, and the bar has to fill up, and essentially during this entire duration, you cannot move. Once it's finished, right at this point for Lux, right here, once she's cast like this, you can move. But for Lux, she has an animation here that is like, okay, well, she's doing this cast animation and she does like a very low body thing and she does this swipe, boom, and she's very cool. If you do this straight into a run, it doesn't look that great. Uh, if you do this straight into blend into idle, it doesn't look that great. So she has a follow-up animation if you're not moving where she goes from this into a hop into a standing idle, which feels a little bit more natural. Right that, right? Not perfect, but good enough. And um, if you were to transition to run, then you could. Um, but again, that kind of animation where you go from that into the idle is something you don't normally see because most of the time you cast your Q while running away from something and trying not to die. Uh, so in game and in practice, it's not something you see normally. But for the character whole like polished element, it's to sort of tie everything together and make it look nice. Um, I think also there's an example that we were talking about, I guess, for Star Garden Ari. Oh my god, I have ads on my own video. I'm not monetizing this, am I? I thought I wasn't. Why are there ads?
Okay, cool. So I explained this a little bit. Um, actually, we, I guess we can watch this portion. I'm going to mute engine for a bit. And we're going to listen to past me for a little bit. How this would all work in motion. Did this, but in a cute magical girl way. You'll remember that I did a pose in my early explorations where the tails were shaped into a heart. This pose here actually captured a lot of the energy that I was looking for, and I kind of wanted to use this as a starting point. The next steps were really for me to figure out how this would all work in motion. And to better explain this, I want to quickly go over what the anatomy of a spell is. A spell in League of Legends can generally be broken down into three simple parts. These include the cast window, the hit frame, and then everything after. The cast window is when the character is performing an action in preparation for a spell to go off. Some abilities can be cast while moving while others cannot, but this first window is basically the character indicating that they're about to fire an ability. Here, the hit frame, is when the actual ability hits or is fired. And everything following this point, the player is no longer locked into the spell animation and can freely choose to command the character, which is basically everything else. In animation, we can use the structure to help organize and plan our poses optimally. The anticipation pose, for example, will sit within the cast window, and our key pose or extreme pose will be our cast frame. And then we can also have some fun with transitions and poses in the everything else bucket. The overall direction for Ari's charm was pretty strong from the get-go, so this animation didn't really see very many revisions. I did change the cast pose to have her arm extended in the direction of the spell so that it could help communicate more directionality. And from an animation perspective, the straight arm does provide a bigger contrast in shape change so that it shows that Ari is pulling her kiss forward. In order to Yeah. Okay. So that sort of to touches upon the same same kind of concept, I think. Um, but that was basically explaining how a character winds up for their animation, whether or not there's a lock, and then when can you can when you can move. Um, it is always very very tricky. I think um, there are some games, for example, that like you can cancel anything at any point in time. But I think for most things where you have fighting, there is the trigger, there is the part that happens until the actual action completes. That is like, I guess, the attack or the windup. And then you have canceling, which, you know, for example, if you play Super Smash, attacks happen longer for heavy characters, shorter for light characters. They have a sort of like a follow through at the end. But if you know and are really good at the game, you can cancel certain things with certain abilities and get things to happen faster so that you're not animation locked. And that is like mastery of the game. Um, animators are always like, oh my God, they're canceling my animation. They don't get to see all the cool stuff, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but you know, even for Genshin Impact, the moment you hit the click button and she's doing the wind up for her action, she's just gonna do it, right? And then once she's done whatever she needs to do for the swipe, you just keep spamming the left click until she can do the next thing, right? Uh, that's how that works, right? Like you just spam left click and then you can can you can cancel out all of this, right? Versus you do like you get to see one, two, three, four, five. No, just like spin, click everything, just so you get more damage off, right? Cool. Wow, that was a lot of stuff. I was not expecting for that to go that for that to go that long. Cool. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. I think next time. So I'm probably gonna wrap up the stream a little bit right here. It's been two hours and a half. I feel like I'll, I'll do like animation kind of related stuff once a week, for now. I kind of want to do it more often, but I think for now, one week, one week is okay. But yeah, thank you for dropping by, everyone. There's a lot of you today that came by. Usually, it's just playing me playing League, and then there's like three people, and they're my friends. But I appreciate all of you guys um, just hanging out and chilling. But yeah, thanks everyone for dropping by. Appreciate it. I am probably going to try to get some sleep.
Actually, psych. Okay, wait. Do we still have people here? People are still hanging out in the stream? I'm going to actually transfer all of us. I forgot that I can do this. But if people are still here, we're going to raid another stream just because. <laughs> I need to do this more often. I don't normally have this many people, so we're going to try raiding. But whoever is left, we're going to figure this out. <laughs> it's my first time doing it, but we only have one person on my list right now. That I am following. So we're just going to go over to Soju. Soju is a friend of mine at Riot. She is a concept artist and she does amazing work. I think she's playing Apex Legends. So sorry for the whiplash in game content. We are going into first person shooter now, but uh, let's do it. 